my name is Kristen Krokowski. I'm here in Waukesha County, and it is a beautiful fall day, so thanks for joining us. Um, and today we're going to talk about soil testing, and we're just going to talk about basically the basics of soil testing. And I'll hold this for a second. We're going to just talk about the basics of uh, soil testing and kind of why you should do it. And I will get started with the actual slides. Can you see the slides? We can yes. see your first screen, but we didn't see it move. OK, just one second. OK. Um, so OK, well, this is interesting. We can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Just one second. I'm going to, um, oh, here we go. You can turn your camera off if you need to, too. Okay. First slide. Go. Awesome. Sorry for the yes. bumpy start. Um, so why test your soil? You can see here, if you look at a, a map of Wisconsin, this is our soil regions of Wisconsin map from the Wisconsin Geological and Natural Survey. Um, our soil is highly variable. What grows for me here might not grow up um, grow well up in the La Crosse area or the Green Bay area or even down the road from me. Um, our soils are highly variable, especially in certain areas of the state, like here where I live in the Kettle Moraine, where we have little pockets of all different kinds of soil that have been deposited. Um, you know, so for example, on our farm, we have about 40 acres and we have at least four or five distinctly different soil types. So it's always important to think about what your, um, what your goals are, what you wanna do with your soil and the different areas of your yard or the different areas you might be using. So let's take a look at one of the reasons. So these are some pictures that I recently took um, and you can see both of the plants that are both the rose and the other plant on the front of the screen are experience, experiencing extreme nutrient deficiency. And this is because basically they've been watered with uh, water of a soil pH that's, or of a pH that's nine. So that really high pH is making nutrients unavailable. And we'll go through all of this a little bit, but I just wanna give you an example about why test your soil. It's really about, so you can do, put the right plant in the right place and uh, treat it right once you get in there and do the right cultural practices. So what is your soil test going to tell you? It's gonna tell you your soil's nutrient level that includes organic matter, which is basically an indicator of your nitrogen levels and then your phosphorus, potassium, and pH. So those are the basics that you'll get with a soil test. And those will kind of lead you in the right direction of where you wanna go for what you wanna do with that area of ground. And you'll also get recommendations. So they'll test your levels. They'll give you a little description um, of the levels in your soil and how those, are, how those relate to um, what you're trying to grow. Um, but it also gives you a recommendation of how much fertilizer to apply for what you're wanting to grow also. So when do you want to sample? So when the ground isn't frozen. I mean, technically, could you, could you sample when it's frozen? Yes, it's going to be really, really hard to try to dig down in that dirt and get your random samples if the ground is frozen. So we don't advise it. Um, we don't really advise you to do it after a big heavy rain when it's all kind of mucky and wet. Um, if you're going to do something like that, or if you need to do something like that for uh, reasons of time, then please do, you know, spread it out on some newspaper or something else and let it air dry before you mix it up and put it into a bag to, to send to us. Um, it's always a good idea to send in your soil sample before you need the results. Uh, generally, the results will take one to two weeks to get results back, but in the busy spring season when lots of people are sending in their soil samples, it could take a 
three to five or a little bit longer than that. So uh, we don't want a soil sample if you've recently applied any kind of fertilizer, um, if it's a hose end fertilizer, if it's a uh, fertilizer with your pesticide application, if it's just drop spreader, if your lawn service has been through there with a fertilizer, um, you want to wait at least a week or so until after that's kind of had a chance to wash off. So it's always good to wait at least for a rain um, before you start testing your soil because basically you don't want to be seeing that fertilizer in your results because that'll kind of give you a false idea of what's actually there. So where are you going to sample? So you want to sample separately areas that are managed differently. Um, so if you have a vegetable garden in one area of your yard, you're growing turf in another area of your yard, and you have uh, flowers and ornamentals in a different area, you might decide to do three separate soil tests. Um, the reason you do this is because partly uh, when you um, submit the soil sample, they're gonna ask you what you're trying to grow in that area so they can give you better recommendations for the crop that you're trying to grow. So um, the fertilizer application for turf grass is gonna be different than the fertilizer recommendations if you're growing tomatoes um, in the garden. So consider that um, if you feel like you have a pretty uniform uh, yard and you can put those together and then kind of figure out where the happy medium is uh, between, you know, fertilizing your turf and, you know, doing more fertilizer or different fertilizer for your tomatoes. If you think that just knowing what you have, you can figure that out, then you can always go with just one sample. But sometimes at least the first time out, you might want to do those samples separately. Um, second, uh, problem areas. So if you have specific areas in your yard that aren't growing well, that you have uh, repeated dead spots, especially in lawn areas, you might want to make those a completely different soil sample. Um, it may be that the soil is different in that area or there is a nutrient, a different nutrient composition in that area. Uh, you might have really low organic matter. But if you have a problem area, you can really focus on that area and have a soil sample just for that. And it'll give you a lot better ideas of kind of where to go with that and how to treat it in the future. Or if it even is a soil problem that you're experiencing. So when you're sample, you really want to try to get a, a representative sample. So you don't just want to get your... Uh, soil from the very top of the soil, you want to get kind of a sample that's going to be where the roots of your plants and your grass is going to be. So you want to make sure you have a clean, clean trowel or soil. So you're not bringing in soil from something else. You're not bringing in planting mix that had um, Osmocote or miracle Grow or something on it because you don't want it to kind of taint your sample. Once you have that clean trowel or soil probe, um, and I will mention that um, soil probes, a lot of county offices will let you borrow them. So you come in and you may or may not have to put down a little deposit that generally we ask for a check and then you, we just give that check back to you when you return it. Um, but soil probes do make things a lot easier and a lot faster. Um, but if you don't have one, there are definitely, you can definitely use a trowel or even a shovel. Um, you want to remove anything above the soil from your sample. So turf, mulch, thatch, bugs, um, you know, compost. You definitely don't want to spread compost all over your grass and then take a soil sample because that will skew re your results. You just want to go to the area that you're going to sample. You're going to collect your samples from that top five to seven inches. And then you want to do four to 10 random mini samples from that area. So mini doesn't mean less than five inches or less than seven inches. It just means you're going to do four to 10 of those um, soil samples that are five to seven inches deep. So if you're using a trowel, you can make take smaller amounts than you would get with the soil probe. But you're basically going to collect all of that. You need at least about one cup of soil and then you then in the next um, slide, we're going to talk about what you do with that. 
So you're going to take all of your mini samples and you're com going to combine them um, from each of the areas being tested. So if you decided to do three soil tests, you're going to mix the little mini samples from each of those areas you're having tested separately. Uh, do dry them out if they're wet. If they're even you know, good and moist, if you can dry them out, it helps. And you're also going to pay a heck of a lot less postage on dry soil than wet soil. Um, Combine those together, get them good and mixed together. So you can either put them in like a one gallon Ziploc bag, dump all your samples in there, kind of ground, ground them around and shake them around um, and make sure they're kind of uniform. And then take a cup of that soil out of there and put it in a different bag um, or any other way that you think, you know, put a bit, you can put it in a little pile or a little bowl or whatever works for you. But the goal is to make sure that you mix those samples together well, and then it's kind of uniform throughout. And then you're going to send in about a, a cup of that soil. It doesn't have to be exactly a cup. If you end up with three quarters of a cup, that's fine. Um, but you're shooting for something close to a cup. So don't mix those samples from different areas you're testing. So don't mix the garden with the lawn or the lawn with the bed or the problem area with the the vegetables just to make sure that your results um, are really going to help you and be really useful to you. Um, and then be sure to remove anything else um, from there that's just not soil. So um, remove, in addition to organic matter, you can remove those rocks, you can remove bugs, you can remove anything in there that's just not soil. So there are a couple of different ways for you to get your, your soil sample to our labs or to a lab in your area. Um, but you're going to want to label the bag with your name and contact information. So should your bag get separated from your form or from your submission, then it, they can match the two up. So there's no confusion about, hey, does anybody know where this bag of soil came from? Um, so you're gonna label that with your name and contact information. You're gonna fill out the soil sample form. Um, and what I'll mention here is, is the fourth bullet. So if you're going to a different lab or you're trying to get a different test, you need to be very careful to fill out the form that goes with the test that you're trying to get. Um, there are multiple forms on the UW Extension uh, Soil and Forage Labs um, website and you want the one for homeowners. If you're a homeowner, there are also ones for things like uh, hunting food plots. There are things for um, general crops like corn and soybeans. So you wanna make sure you have the right form for what you're trying to test for so that they perform the tests and they do the assessments according to what you're putting in that area. Um, sometimes the forms can have a lot of words in them and a lot of small print on them. So just be careful to fill out um, as much as possible. Um, don't leave things out just because um, you think that they might not like your answers. Um, soil tests are definitely not a place where people are concerned or judging you. They just need the more information they have, the better they can give um, recommendations. And then the last one is you can mail the sample to the lab. Um, or possibly drop it at your county office. Please do call your county extension office before you just drop off bags of soil. Um, each county office has a different policy and handles that kind of in a different way. And if you don't live near a county office, it will probably be a lot um, more manageable for you to mail it. Uh, the address you're gonna mail it to will be on that submission form. So you can just follow the directions on that form um, and send it in. So what do you get? So I, I took my soil samples. I did my part of the job. I got all my uh, samples together. I mixed them. I mailed them in. And now I'm just um, hanging out, waiting for my results. So the things that you're going to get back from the lab, if you do a general lawn or a general yard um, soil test, is you're going to get your soil pH. And your soil pH is a measure of acidity or alkalinity. So is your pH lo low and you, it's acidic soil or is it high in an alkaline soil? Your amount of organic matter, which is going to tell you a lot about how much nitrogen you might need. Um, 
your currently available phosphorus. So um, there's phosphorus in our soils that's not available for plants. What they're going to talk to you about or the results they're gonna get you is what's available for plants to use in the soil because it really doesn't matter if it's there if the plants can't use it. And then the same thing for potassium. So that will take care of your basic numbers on that that bag, the nitrogen for organic matter, P for phosphorus, and K for potassium. And then they're going to give you fertilization recommendations based on the crop being grown. So if you say you're growing turf there, they're going to give you a recommendation for growing healthy turf. Um, if you say you're growing potatoes there, then they're going to grow, give you a recommendation based on that. The reason we care about soil pH um, is because nutrient availability is really dependent on pH. So I just wanna show this to you quickly. It is based on a 14 point scale, around seven is neutral. This is not something um, you need to be terribly concerned about if it says that the optimum range for growing tomatoes is gonna be 6.5 to 7.5 and your soil pH is 7.8 it is not something you need to really worry about. Uh, plants are very forgiving, um, especially within a range. If you tell me, you know, tomatoes need to be grown between 6.5 and 7.5, I don't start worrying until it's 8.5 or 4.5, or maybe even in the fives um, that you might need to do some adjustments. So plants are very versatile and can grow in a lot of different environments. There are some um, exceptions for that, um, you know, some of our plants really need an acidic soil like blueberries or azaleas or rhododendrons. Um, but otherwise, especially with vegetables, they're, they're fairly able to um, kind of flex and grow in whatever soil they have. Um, the optimal soil pH is based on the needs of the plant, which I just mentioned. Um, changing the soil pH with lime or sulfur, so lime would make it more alkaline, sulfur would make it more acidic, requires thorough mixing in the soil. So this is not spreading it on the top of your soil. This is if you are um, doing a garden and you are tilling the soil, you need to till that soil and you need to mix that in. So lime and sulfur have to be known repeatedly and have to be actually incorporated into the soil for it to work effectively. Sur surface applications tend to be ineffective. It might give you a little boost in one way or another, but you, you are definitely going to be doing that on a regular basis. And it's only effective, um, it's only minorly effective for a short time and changes in pH. Um, we have underneath our topsoil, we have something called parent material, which is you know, the minerals that are below our soil, um, a good chunk of the state has limestone under it, which really brings the pH of the soils up. So it's really, um, you're really trying to fight nature and the kind of equilibrium of where your yard wants to be if you're trying to drastically change the um, soil pH. So organic matter are the plants and animal residues, living microbial cells and residues, and then decomposition plants products of plants and animal residues. So that's what's going to make up your organic matter. All of those living things um, that are in there and decaying in the soil and creating new soil are the things that we have that make up our organic matter. So fine and medium textured soils have about two to 4% organic matter. Sandy soils have less than 2% organic matter. Um, adding organic matter is great but it needs to be done on a regular basis to be maintained. So if you have low organic matter and you're going to add compost or something like that, um, expect it to be there for the season. Um, as it mentions, it improves your water holding capacity, your drainage, your tilth, um, but only 10% of that organic matter is gonna remain. So organic matter is the part of your soil that's rapidly turning over. Um, and keeps decomposing and new organic matter comes to take its place. So it's not the kind of a thing that you apply um, like, a, like a mineral that's gonna stay a lot around a long period of time. Potassium phosphorus, um, this is a tomato leaf with phosphorus deficiency. That's why it's all purple like that. Your soil test is gonna indicate deficiency or excess. 
Um, Wisconsin soils have often have um, high to excessive levels of phosphorus already, and certain areas of the state have those high to excessive levels of potassium. This is another reason why it's really important to get your soil tested because you might be spending a lot of money on nutrients that your yard doesn't even need and doesn't even want you to apply. So you could actually be moving it too high from high to excessive um, when that's not really what's best for your plants. Um, and it's definitely not best for your pocketbook. Uh, fertilizer has definitely become more expensive over the last few years. So if you get your soil test back um, and your levels of those two nutrients are below optimum levels, they're gonna recommend the application rate um, that fits the crop that you're growing. If you're growing grass, it's gonna give you something that uh, works with grass. If, it's, if you're growing tomatoes, tomatoes. So um, it'll be um, specific to that. And if you're growing things like vegetable crops, um, and it may be true for soil. I haven't I haven't noticed this on the, it'll give you different application times too. Like it'll say, put on half of the fertilizer in the spring when you plant and then the other half, you know, at bloom or something like that, depending on the plant. So this is part of your soil test that you will get in the mail. Um, this is a, a test from down here and you down here in Waukesha County, you can see the pH of the soil um, is over 7.5, but it's not up to eight. So we're kind of in that range right there. It's a fairly high soil pH, but it's kind of on the edge of, uh, you know, is not high enough that we're concerned at this point. Um, the phosphorus is excessive. Um, that little arrow at the end says that there's even more than excessively high, like the test doesn't read it. Um, so we really don't need to ever, ever apply phosphorus in our soils because there's so much of it available to plants just um, right there where it's at. The potassium levels for this particular soil test were 125 parts per million, which is um, kind of the low end of sufficient. So for a growing plants in this area, we're going to have to add some potassium. So how does that relate to the bag? Um, you know, we, we get this test and it's got colored lines on it. And then we go to the store and that's all got to be kind of translated into what's on the bag. So the numbers are in order on the bag. So guaranteed analysis is 8024. So that eight is nitrogen. Um, the zero is potassium or phosphorus and the last one is potassium. So um, know that that's what those numbers are indicating. And so when you're looking at the bag, that's what you, you wanna be aware of. Um, the number indicates the percent of each nutrient in the bag. So that bag is 8% nitrogen and 24% potassium. There's no phosphorus in there. So if it's a 50 pound bag, to find out how much is in there, you're gonna take that number eight, multiply it times 50, and you know there's four pounds in that bag. Potassium, you know, it's 24%. So 24% times 50 is gonna be 12 pounds. So when they give you your recommendations for application in two pounds per 1,000 square feet, you can figure out how much you're gonna to need to apply. So half of that, Basically, if you're looking for two pounds of nitrogen, you're going to do half of that 50 pound bag over your area to get that two pounds. I'm happy to answer questions on this if you have them. Um, so this is the other part of the test. Uh, our pH was high, so there's no um, need to apply lime to this area. Um, applying lime when it's not recommended is actually bad. Um, will make your um, soil actually more alkaline. Um, and then it talks about the specific nutrients needed. So it needs, you know, 0.3 pounds per 100 square feet. So it'll tell you the nutrient needs pounds per square feet, 0.3 for 100 square feet, no phosphorus, and 0.2 for your potassium. And you'll just go back to the bag um, and you'll figure out, you know, for this particular garden, if it's only 100 square feet, you probably just need a little bag and um, do a little math and you will be fine. And then they'll include some tips and things like that. 
Um, the other thing I'll say is you can always call the lab and ask. Um, they're very helpful. Um, so if you got if you got your soil test from them, <laughs> they will have your results. And if you have a question or something that you don't understand, they'll be happy to address it. There are other tests that you can get in addition to just your general test, and these will be extra fees, but they include a physical analysis um, telling you if it's clay, low sand, or silt, soluble salts, calcium and magnesium, and then lead. And this is recommended for neighborhoods where you're going to grow vegetables or you, if you have small children and your neighborhood was developed before 1979. Other advice, um, topsoil and subsoil are different. So when we do new construction or we dig up an area and we turn that soil over, the top part of that is really great for growing things and the stuff underneath is really bad for growing things. So if you've recently disturbed your soil and turn that over and mix it, mixed it, um, you may be having problems related to that, especially if you're growing turf grass, um, you can see some problems with uh, where you're trying to grow it in subsoil versus the topsoil. Don't add gypsum or lime unless it's recommended. Um, Influence don't know what's best for your soil. There are a lot of people who tell me things about um, what they think should be applied because they saw a video on YouTube. Um, and this person said, if you do this, then your lawn won't have weeds. As we saw from the map, our soils are different. Your soil may be different from your neighbor's soil. So it's really important to have a soil test and do recommend recommendations that are based on the science of what um, your soil really is and not just people who are trying to get more likes and more fo followers and um, saying things that will make them popular. What they say may be true for a specific area, but you just can't rely on it for everything. Don't add phosphorus, potassium, or micronutrients if the levels are already high to excessive because those do accumulate in the soil and don't necessarily move away. And there are uh, times when you can get toxicity from different nutrients in your soil. Uh, timing is important. So, um, you know, the fertilization needs to go on when it should go on. There's no point fertilizing your lawn mid-November um, or in April just because the grass isn't ready to take the grass, the soil temperature isn't warm enough for any plant to be able to start taking up those nutrients. So it generally just washes through. Um, there are a lot of things out there that aren't fully understood. So I won't begin to weigh in on things um, that you can buy at the garden center that I have no idea how they affect the soil long term or if they're valuable at all. And then organic amendments really slowly while inorganic amendments are accessible to plants quickly. So when we talk about compost or manure, those decompose over a slower amount of time. While if you are adding um, something like a granulated fertilizer, that will be um, available in the soil a lot more quickly. So I'm hoping I have left time for questions. I hope that um, that was understandable. And I will take a second to uh, try to fix my camera so that you're not looking at the ceiling. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, we are going to wrap up, um, but I will mention a couple of things. There is a survey link in the chat that will also pop up at the end of our webinar when we close out. We would really appreciate to hear your feedback on this webinar, as well as uh, find out what other topics you might be interested in. Um, so thank you for that, Kristen. Lots of great information. We've also linked up in the chat to the UW Soil and Forage Lab, which has all of the soil testing information on there as well as other publications. I did see a couple questions come in about, well, if I don't have an extension office, where can I get a kit? How can I get a bag to send it in? You don't need a special bag to send it in. You can use a Ziploc bag. Just make sure you seal that bag and then package that up in a in a box or a padded envelope um, or something with padding and you can mail your sample directly to the lab um, and that is probably the easiest way to do that. This webinar was recorded so we will have the recording up on our Extension Horticulture website in a few days so look for that give us you know three to four days to get that listed. Um, I want to thank everybody again and have a great day.